Did Pope Francis deny the divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? This has been claimed by an Italian atheist journalist, journalist, Scalfari. He is the same journalist who interviewed Pope Francis back in March of 2018, in which he claimed that Pope Francis said that hell does not exist, that evil souls are snuffed out, that they are annihilated. We'll look at that quote in today's show, but we'll also look at this new quote that says that Jesus wasn't God before the cross. It's a common modernist myth. And we'll talk about whether Scalfari is accurately describing what Francis said and what Francis and other Jesuits actually hold that. You know, Tim, as I was reading this, I said, you know, I've heard Jesuits say something similar, not this radical. And I'm wondering if Scalfari heard the Jesuit modernist version and to do something more. Ultimately, it all boils down to Arianism. <laughs> but it's pretty ra it's radical enough. Yeah, it's it, even it's, even if Scalfari's only understanding a certain position on the divinity of Christ, it needs to be torn to shreds. Of course. So this is this is outrageous stuff. It is. People. This is this is insane. So and then and then of course we'll also talk about the Vatican's clarification or lack thereof afterwards. So let's pray and we'll jump into it. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, quies in Celi, Sancti Vigetur Nomen Tuum, Adveniat Regnum Tuum, Fiat Voluntas Tua, Sicut in Cielo et in Terra, Panum Nostrum Quotidianum da Nobis Odie, et Dimite Nobis Debita Nostra, Sicut in Nos Dimitimus Debitoribus Nostris, et Ne Nos Inducas in Tentationem, Se Libera Nos Amalo. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. St. Peter. Pray for us. Pray for us. All right. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, an article. There's articles all over in the secular press and in the uh, Catholic press. I was looking this morning at a couple of them, but just for simplicity, I pulled up the LifeSite one. And uh, it reads, Pope's favored interviewer claims Francis denies Christ's divinity. I guess we should touch, Tim, before we jump into the actual text and the words and what's being claimed here, who this Eugenio Scalfari is. I did a little bit of research on him, mm -hmm. and uh, he's the founder of La Repubblica, which is, I don't, I mean, is this a big, you live there, Tim, longer than I have, is this a big newspaper? Yeah, I mean, yeah what, what, when I, when you, whether you ride La Linea A or B, you know, the little the little mm -hmm. X-shaped metro in Rome. You like they that metro? Are, you like that metro? I, I like A, yeah. Okay. I like A. I don't, I don't like B. And then now there's a C, I'm told. Did you hit C ever? No, I never go down. I, don't, I hate it. Oh, you hate it? I, I'd I like rather it. walk than get in there. I just feel like I'm, I like I'm, I'm, I feel like I can get mugged every time I'm in there. <clears throat> yeah, but they don't. Yeah, it's not like New York, though. That's because we're Americans. We're used to uh, high <laughs> I don't crime. know, man. It's like gypsies crawling around in there. I know. If anything, they're going to take your wallet. Anyway, anytime I would be on, uh, I'd be on A, they'd be flashing this in my face. And I was like, who who runs this? So I looked it up in oh, 2007. Okay. And I learned who Scalfari was in 2007. And I, I'm like, this is a socialist atheist rag. Right. Not that New York Times isn't. But, I mean, it, it owns it more. You know, it owns it more. So I've known, yeah, I've known about Scalfari for a while. And I remember when Francis started giving him interviews. I think this is his fifth now, his fifth or his fourth. And I was like, why would you do this? And also, I think I heard as far back as 07, 08, Scalfari's method for taking notes and, and his erstwhile way of giving interviews. It's not, it doesn't conduce to good stuff, even if you are trying to do to good stuff but the point is when he's known for just taking notes in an interview and they're not precise notes he's not taking shorthand he takes notes and then he reconfigures direct quotes so it, it doesn't work it's not meant to work and if you give an interview it means you know that he's going to be reconfiguring you know and i was thinking about this because there's an advantage to him and to the interviewee using this method. And that is, well, I'm Scalfari. That's how I do it. And it may not mm -hmm. be accurate. So it gives deniability to him 
and to right. the person being interviewed, there's there is a sinister advantage to this. Yes. And we've seen the Vatican press office use it each time. Well, Scalfari doesn't record or take precise notes. He often goes off memory. It's a free and personal interpretation of what was said in the moment. Wow. And, you know, this is exactly what the modernists want to say happens with the Gospels. No True. one was there with the recorder. This is, you know, when we read the Gospels and we read what our Lord Jesus said, what the modernists say is, you know, these are just sort of personal, free reflections that people had, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. So we don't need to think right. of the Gospels as the Word of God, the Word right. of Jesus Christ, the Word of the Word. This is kind of just, you know, people later on putting together maybe some notes, mainly their memory. You know, and now the problem with that is, you know, at my Mass, when they read the Gospels, we stand up which means we think these are the words of Jesus. We even sit down for the words of Paul or Moses. But when it's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, please stand up. We do. Right. The The other major point that I don't want to be undeveloped that you're sort of making is why, why would this be so advantageous to the interviewer and the interviewee to be able to express uh, a paraphrase as a, as a direct block quote. Mm -hmm. Well, here's why. Because this is the beating heart of modernism. In, in literature, it's the beating heart of postmodernism, right? To plant a seed with, as you call it, plausible deniability is everything that modernism, postmodernism, structuralism is about. Because you're saying something without really saying it. Now, yes. there, are, there are textual ways of doing this. We call it connotation, right? I mean, rather than denotation, you can you can connote something without saying it. But but the postmodern way of doing this and the way that the modernists in the church have have been very, very successful at doing it in biblical criticism, you know, hi historical criticisms of Jesus in insinuations in uh, uh, what we call weaponized ambiguity in you know, even church documents, magisterial documents. But now here we have whatever you call the sort of teaching voices being exercised by the Pope talking to this old La Repubblica editor and, and saying it to the world and saying it to Europe. Probably say, I mean, my guess is saying basically these things. Then afterwards, he can honestly level the criticism, which was barely leveled by the Vatican mouthpiece, you know, 12 hours later. Oh, well, that's not precisely what I said. That's his interpretation of what I said. Are you are you kidding me? That's yeah. not even much of a cover job. It, it is, but it's, it's a dream come true for them. It's great. Yeah, this is who they want to have. Now, you know, you think about it, two two dubia fathers, you know, died waiting to have a conversation with Francis. Last week, Slim Jim Martin met with Francis. Scalfari gets to meet all these jokers get to meet with Francis. Yes, they do. <laughs> And the people who need to meet with them are blocked there by the Swiss Guard. It's right, insane. His, his, it's insane. The okay, well, let's look Cardinals at let's guys. look at what Scalfari wrote. This was on Wednesday in La, in, in La Repubblica. All right. So uh, here let me put it on the screen. People can follow along. Is that it? Okay. La Repubblica newspaper Wednesday. Scafari wrote, quote, those who have had the chance, as I have at different times, to meet him, that is Pope Francis, and speak with him and speak to him with the greatest cultural confidence. Interesting. Know that Pope Francis conceives Christ as Jesus of Nazareth, a man, not God incarnate. Once incarnated, Jesus ceases to be a God and becomes a man until his death on the cross. According to Scalfari, quote, when I happened to discuss these phrases, Pope Francis told me they are the definite proof that Jesus of Nazareth, once he became a man, even if he was a man of exceptional virtue, was not God at all, end quote. And there's the problem. Here's the quote that he attributes, and he puts 
quotes on it. They are the definite proof that Jesus of Nazareth, once he became a man, even if he was a man of exceptional virtue, was not God at all. End quote. Tuh. Spit. This is vile. I have to this spit out the words of heresy out of my mouth. It's disgusting. Not to mention, the first time I heard it, and I don't know if you heard it, I heard it early in the morning. I got up to get a drink, and I, I saw my phone, and people from the East Coast had been texting me. I heard it that Francis had said, which I think actually is incorrect. I, meaning like me, my pontificate, I am the proof that Jesus was just a man. I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, I was, it was the middle of the night. I'm stumbling around for a drink of water. I was like, you know, I think I kind of like saw it, that on Twitter somewhere. It was on Twitter. That's yeah, where yeah. I, that's where I saw it. And then but someone seen it in a text. screenshotted it. No, so they screenshotted it and texted it to me. I, saw, I, I mean, I was just like, what is going on? I woke up and found that it was these words are blah, blah, blah. doesn't change it that much. People right. have to understand. Arianism is the first heresy mega in heresy. Christian it's the history. the first mega heresy. Yeah. And, and, I mean, take the first 300 years of Christian history for the purposes of what I'm saying here and kind of lop them off, right? Because before Constantine, there was no such – there's Christianity, but there wasn't Christendom. Right. Take those and lop them right off. Within two decades of Christendom, of of uh, uh, Constantine legalizing Christianity with the Edict of Milan, within two decades less, you had Arius doing his thing and Constantine himself, the emperor, calling the council uh, yes. of Nicaea, the first ecumenical council. This uh, – there's a couple of historical points that I think matter here. One, you know – Cardinal Carlo Cafara, good Dubia Cardinal, great great guy. God bless all four of the Dubia Cardinals. Cafara was he was he was the uh, the heart. Many people say of yes. the Dubia Cardinals. He's, the he smiling. Was, uh, he one. was the putative leader of the Dubia. That, that's right. Fathers, that's Dubia right. brothers. And you always saw him, Dubia fathers with different band. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, they've grown up. Right, but. He said right before he lied, at uh, before he died at the uh, Rome Life Forum in May of 2017, four months before he died, he said, "Quote: Look, creation works this way. The, the Perugia is going to work this way. It's going to be an uncreation." He was talking about the family, yep. but he was insinuating that there's a symmetry to the way that end times will roll up, creation, uncreation. So. I see a similar symmetry here, and it's startling. I mean, people ought to be more than just startled. I see a similar symmetry in the way that it was the first heresy, right, leading to the Nicene Creed, which we say every mass at church. If if, Pope, if this is true about Pope Francis, then he's crossing his fingers every time he says the Nicene Creed, right? And that means that we're kind of backing out the same way. There would be a, a historical symmetry uh, of heresy. And to me, that's startling. The other real quick point I just wanted to make, because I'll forget to make it if we don't, is what you have in the first three or three and a half Christian centuries is um, St. Paul saying, let's bring the gospel to the Gentiles, right? The polytheistic Gentiles who believed in Zeus and Hercules, right? And that was decided at the Council of Jerusalem. Let's bring the gospel to the Gentiles without making them have to be Jews first. Let's not make Judaism, where you understand monotheism through the conduits of uh, circumcision, through the conduits of uh, keeping kosher. Let's do it without a middle step, and there's no real process of catechesis. So what's the natural danger? I mean, that's good. That's good he did it. That's the Holy Spirit, whatever. Bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But look what it produces, right? A couple centuries later— these Gentiles that are not Jews, they're not Judaized, they say, oh yeah, I, I get this this Trinity thing. This this is kind of like uh, Zeus and Hercules, half-god, demigod, right? right. So I, I always figured that that contributed to the worldwide misunderstanding. I'm not saying Ar Arius himself you know, was that uneducated, but that's, I think, why um, in the neo-Christian world, uh, of of Gentile converts, I think Arianism caught so hard, so fast. Yeah. Pope Francis, twenty 
and a half centuries later does not have a similar or even <laughs> likewise or comparable availing. He doesn't have that excuse. This is direct. This is intentional. This is if, – if, if it's true, and I, I think it is, that people need to be – this needs to be a new level. Yeah. All right. Let's 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 dip our toes into some Nouvelle Théologie, talk about modernism, talk about the 20th century, and discuss a little bit – explain to people. I want to explain to people what <coughs> – aberrant theo theologians started saying in the 40s and 50s actually before that really around in the 19 aughts in the 19 teens the modernist remember modernism wants to take everything supernatural and naturalize it so christ said you know he multiplied the loaves the modernist says well that was just people sharing their lunch which we all also so heard yeah, from if there's a supernatural miracle like our Lord walking on water, they say, well, you know, it was really cold that day. It's kind of icy out. He's walking on the ice. <laughs> you know, or or he was walking on the shore, and from where they were with the reflection, it looked like he was walking on water. Right. You know, this is, you know, the, the water didn't turn to blood. It's got this red silt in it during the time of Moses. That's modernism. The ultimate form of modernism is the naturalizing of Jesus, the Son of God, so that he is only Jesus of Nazareth. He can be Christ, he can be Messianic, but he's not right. going to be Yahweh. He's not going to be consubstantial with the Father. Like you said, Tim, you know, the Greeks had a perfect understanding of this. You could have great men who become gods, and then you can mm -hmm. also have men who are demigods, one parent is a god, and so they're a semi-god, or a demigod. All, all the pagans have this. Catholicism teaches Christ is fully God and fully man, 100% God, 100% man. And, Christ, and so traditionally, if you read Thomas Aquinas, the scholastics, they believe that Christ, from the moment he assumed human nature in the immaculate womb of the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. he had the beatific vision, he was fully God. He's a divine person. Yes, he assumed a human nature. He's a he's a divine person. He has the beatific vision. He has it even on the cross. Thomas Aquinas says Christ has the beatific vision on the cross. In his highest intellect, he sees the essence of God in his in the lower portions of his soul, down where the passions are. He's in anguish. Right? He's in his passion. He's in. He has agony. But all these mysteries are happening in Christ. Right. In the 1900s, this was unacceptable to people. If you don't believe that Christ multiplied the loaves or walked on water, you certainly don't believe that he's fully God all the time. So in Protestantism in the 1800s and then in liberal modernist Catholicism in the 1900s, they came up with this thesis. You ready, folks? Christ was just a man, but his example in his virtue excelled all other humans who have ever lived because of his teaching on love one another right do unto others all these things sermon on the mount that when he died on the cross he was so misunderstood the ultimate victim that the apostles whenever they thought of him it was like he was there with them mm -hmm. and that's what resurrection means resurrection means that when we think of jesus he was so good and so awesome and such a good teacher that he's with us in our hearts. And that, they say, is what Easter is. And in that way, he becomes God. He is divine. Because in a way, he's omnipresent. He's, he's with us all. If the ancient Romans could elevate Caesar to a God, well, we elevate Christ to a God by our faith and our devotion and our love for one another and our, get ready for it, community. When we come together as a community, we see that Jesus is divine. And so this is, you know, Pope Pius X fought this. He decreed the oath against modernism. He tried to stamp this out. It went underground. It popped back up, and it popped up big time in the Jesuits. 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. M not all, 
but 60% of the bad players at Vatican II and after Vatican II are Jesuits. This is no surprise if you went to a Jesuit high school, right, Tim? No, that's right. That's <laughs> and right. this is how they understand it. So I'm thinking that this Scalfari is hearing this form of modernism, and he's just chopping at the root. He's like, oh, Francis says that Christ wasn't God. He even, he even says, let me read this line here, that he says Francis said, which is, they are the definite proof that Jesus of Nazareth, once he became a man, even if he was a man of exceptional virtue, was not God at all. And, and Scalfari even says that, um, he says, uh, Jesus ceases to be a God and becomes a man until his death on the cross. See, here is where they'll grant Christ becomes divine at the cross. And even guys like Balthazar, while we're on it, will say, and you hear this in, in Slim Jim Martin too. Oh, Christ was walking the earth and he was just, you know, he's in, he's like a teenager. He's like, who am I, God? Why am I on this earth? What am I here for? You know, right. he's walking around right. he's like, am I the Messiah? He's with the woman got, at the well. And she says like, you're the Messiah. He's like, I am? Oh my God, I'm the Messiah. <gasps> he's got like teenaged existential angst exactly. almost. Yeah. He's like, am I a am I a skater? Am I a punk? Am I a country yeah. boy? Am I a yeah. prep? Which group do I belong in in my high school? <gasps> right. I'm the messianic figure. And and this is it's this constant opening of new horizons, all this baloney. Opening of new horizons in the person of Christ, where he's figuring all of these things out along the way. And then aha, when he's on the cross, for them, they're like, he finally figures out he's the son of God. They kind of give him, when he enters the womb of Our Lady, he gets divine amnesia. And he spends 33 years accumulating facts and figures out, oh, oh yeah, I'm God. Right. Instead, in the Bible, we read all these people, you know, the angel Gabriel's telling Our Lady this is going to be the Holy One of God. We have the demons shouting it out. Christ says to Our Lady and St. Joseph, did you not know I'd be in my father's house? It's obvious he knows who he is and what he's about and what he's here to do. Right. I think this modernism and this Jesuit approach to Christ is what Scalfari is hearing. He's taking it a step further, but it really doesn't matter. Even if you hold this Jesuit modernist idea, it's still heresy. If you believe that, you can't be saved. You will be damned. This is not the Catholic faith. Unless you believe the Catholic faith, you cannot be saved. So even if Francis holds this little bit lesser view... That's not full blown Arianism. It's still modernism. It's heresy. There's an important connection to between Francis that emerged in my mind in 2016, and then I forgot about it until this newest bout with Arianism in the Francis pontificate. The liberal a uh, Protestant theologian named Adolf von Harnack. I was yeah. just looking it up right now. You know yeah. von Harnack? Oh, yeah. In yeah, 2016, now don't don't quote me, but there there's a, a battle cry, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, Oh yes. that's ascribed to von, von Harnack. Francis allegedly uh, uh, aligns himself with this, and they, they, there was this uh, rumor going around in 2016 that, that he was – he was identifying with this in his pontificate. I never found the direct quote where he had said it, but my ears stood up because von Harnack is dangerous. Von Harnack is pointed at in Pope Benedict the uh, September 11th, 2006 Regensburg address. Yes. Von Harnack is uh, pointed up as the final moment of the de-Hellenization of Christianity. And and here, right. here we mean Hellenized Christianity as as Aristotle, not the not the pagan Greeks. Yep. So he's the final moment. And literally, I, I did a couple papers on Harnack after that. Harnack, tell me, stop me when this stops sounding familiar. <laughs> said that Jesus just had the nicest manners of all humans ever to live. He had, he had like super virtue. Sound familiar? Yeah. He was not actually part of the Trinity uh, while he was alive because that would be polytheism. <laughs> um, 
Jesus was simply the best man to walk the earth, and he was yeah. the son of God, and he was godlike, all the things essentially Jehovah's Witnesses say. Right. But he had the nicest manners, and this is why he, he, was, he didn't do miracles, but he was practically miraculous in his right. virtue. This is what we heard yesterday, and I'm sorry, folks, but it is simply believable. I, we, we haven't even gotten to the non-denial denial yet, but w- which which just furthers what I'm saying, you know, tenfold. But this is von Harnack. People out there, Google Pope Francis von Harnack. There, there are a few things that will come up for you, and it, it, it's ringing my memory for the first time in about three and a half years. But I remember in early 2016 the, the going, uh-oh. I mean, I'd, I'd already been saying, uh-oh, but this is a thing. This is a light motif. This is something that is believed and and dearly um, embraced by the modernists, particularly the liberal German theologians of the late 19th century, which is really, whenever we hear any bit of theology out of Francis, this is it. Yep. This is the closest thing to theology is the liberal Protestant yes. German theology that was being bandied about in the middle 20th century. That's right. Yeah, Harnack is for, you know, everybody, knows, he's a German Lutheran. These German Lutherans were hacking away at the divinity of Christ. Uh, There's Johannes Weiss. He died in 1914. He said, he said something that I've heard Francis say recently, and that is Christ saw himself as this sort of millenarian prophet ushering in the kingdom of God, and he gathered all these Jewish followers, and it was like this, you know, frenzied religious coat, and then just like a Mack truck running into a brick wall, it came to a sudden end when he was crucified. This is Vice, the Lutheran. And he hmm. says, so what happened is his followers created this instrument called the Ecclesia, the church, and sacraments to keep his memory alive and to sort of take his political teachings and spiritualize them. And that this is what Christianity Outrageous. is. I heard Francis say, that uh, Christ experienced failure on the cross. I remember that. And this is this that. is vice. He's tapping into another German Lutheran here. And again, it's not like Francis is, has all these German Lutherans stacked up on his nightstand. The Jesuits have been imbibing all these Protestant Lutherans for a hundred years and regurgitating it in their own books, right? The whole idea here is Christ was a was a really cool revolutionary guy bringing about hope and change in the world. And then he got killed. And so his disciples were like, man, he was so awesome. You know, when I was thinking about him the other day, this is how the they these heretics think of it. They're like, when I was thinking about Jesus the other day, it was like he was in the room with me. I'm like, me too, man. He's still yeah, alive. Bro. Yeah, yeah, he's feel resurrected. It. Joe Once a Field. year, we should get together and we should have a resurrection party. Like, yeah, we should yeah. do that. Let's do that all over the world. In fact, every Sunday, let's get together and have a resurrection party. I'm like, hey, remember that time we ate with them? We should do. We should have like a little meal and invite him every week. That's the Eucharist. Kind of our community will come around. We'll get in a circle and we'll we'll eat bread and drink wine and talk about him. Get this? It's like he's really present. Yeah, it's like he's here. But when we come together, he's here. Yeah, this is what they're talking about, guys. This is yeah. This is Martin Luther chipped away over 400 years. This is the kind of crummy theology you get left over when you deny the Mass, when you deny the Trinity, when you deny everything that was established at the councils and established at Trent and is in the actual canonical Gospels. This is what you get. Say, so Johannes Weiss, you got Harnack. I'm, I'm glad you brought him in. And then you got Carl Bart. Bart, I was oh, okay. So I was waiting for you. I was going to say we need a Bart show. I studied Bart at the Greg. Yeah, they're teaching Bart at the Greg. Oh, they I was love like, him. What the hell is this? Do you yeah, know who books, wrote the, the authoritative Jesus. book on Bart? Balthazar. Balthazar. In fact, Bart said the best book about my me and my theology is the one written by the Catholic Balthazar. Bart Bartazar. Yeah, well, that's they were homies. They were best friends. Yeah. This is we we're going to do a different show today originally. Of course, the news happens and we can never do the shows we kind of really want to do, do. <laughs> but but I mean responding to all this 
Balthazar reconfiguration. I think I think really really accurate reconfiguration. Um, I, I agree with all of it, uh, aside from the preferences by Bishop Barron that he's been doing lately in his recent yeah. shows. I think it's it's very accurate after the council leading to the council. But you can't talk about Balthazar without talking about Bart. You, you beat That's me right. to saying it. That's right. Yeah. yeah no, so, he's. Yeah, I mean the things Bart is saying. He's Swiss Reformed. He's actually not Lutheran. He's Swiss Reformed, though he is influenced by all of these Lutherans. He studied under all these Lutherans in in Germany. You know, he's he's saying this, the same things about Christology. Uh, Balthazar, here's the problem. He even says, you know how we, you know, these Lutherans are saying Christ is like, who am I? You know, who I grow up to be? What's God's plan for my life? Oh, I'm the Son of God. That's amazing. I'm going to offer myself as a sacrifice. Not only right. do they have that going on, but Balthazar takes it one step further and, and backs all that up into the Trinity so that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit constantly presenting new surprises to one another. Oh, yeah. <laughs> new yeah, they, riches, they like new, new, yeah. It's like, hey, God the Father, I have one, I have this new cosmic thing to show you. And he's like, whoa, that's amazing. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. So even yeah. the Trinity is going through self discovery. Right. It's like the Trinity's having Oprah moments. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. This is heresy. I repudiate it publicly. I repudiate all this modernism and heresy. Let us get back to that good old time religion of the Council of Trent. Become a Trentacostal. Do it today. Without a doubt. I, right. I mean, yeah. So let's go, go on about Bart. We need to do a show. We, we need, need to do a show, do a about, show Bart. about Bart. About Bart. Well, I mean, that's all of these. Well, the Rhine flows into the Tiber, doesn't it? Especially today. The German evil theology. I had a professor Wicked. who said, if you caught the devil by the ankle and turned him over, the bottom of his boot would say, made in Germany. It's true. It's true. The bad theology at the Synod, Amazonian Synod right now, German. It's German, Lutheran, modernist. Bad theology at the two synods of the family, German. German. Vatican II. Who were the who were German. the big papas bringing all this nonsense? Germans. German, Swiss, Belgian. Yeah. yeah. And it's always there. The Reformation never left Germany. Yeah. Never left. You know what's kind of crazy? If you really want to back this thing up, Arianism got into the court at Constantinople. Constantinople, when it was semi-Arian, evangelized the Goths, and the Goths were an Arian church. Right. The Goths were Arian. Right. This is, and then they become the. There's the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. Both of them are Arian. This is why in right. the West we have the filioque clause that the Holy right. Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, because amongst the the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, they denied the full divinity of Christ. And so in order to elevate the divinity of the Holy Ghost and to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, not as an independent source, as it says in the councils, shows that Christ is divine. That's why we have that in the West. It's the battle yep. Arianism. Yep. What a mess. So I think I think Francis probably as a Jesuit holds to these ideas. I mean, look at this general superior of the Jesuits. He just denied that Satan is a personal agent, that Satan right. exists. He's just an idea of all the bad stuff you don't like. Well, I mean, that, that goes right hand in hand with the uh, the, I, the bad idea from the last Scalfari interview that uh, you just e evaporate, you know, yeah. as soon as you die, if you're not one of the people that goes to heaven. Um, if Who's going to be your, it's not a technical term, who's going to overlord you in, in hell? You know, well, if there is no hell, if you just. Yeah, let me, read, let, me read, let me read what Scalfari put in March 2018. In March 2018, Scalfari claimed that the Pope told him that hell does not exist. La Repubblica claimed that Pope Francis had told him that the souls of those who do not go to heaven are annihilated. Francis allegedly said, quote, Souls are not punished. And those who repent obtain God's forgiveness and go among the ranks of those who contemplate him. But those who do not repent and cannot be forgiven disappear. There is no hell. 
there is the disappearance of sinful souls. End quote. Scout, end of Scalfari quote. So this is the disappearance of souls. It's annihilationism. It's wrong. It's false. And let me explain briefly from Catholic philosophy why. According to Aquinas, well, according to the scriptures, everything that God creates is good. It, but humans are very good. It says that in Genesis. We are, we are very good because we have an intellect and a soul. We're made in God's image. Because of that, we have, we have the immortality of souls. We have an afterlife. Even the pagans knew this, that we live on because we're good. God will not destroy that. He can't destroy it. The soul is everlasting. It's not eternal. It doesn't pre-exist, but it is everlasting. He doesn't ever snuff him out. It'd be against his nature to destroy something, an immortal soul. Right. What the Pope would be saying here is that souls are mortal. Right. Right. You pull on one one thread and you can you can unravel the whole thing, which is what their favorite pastime yeah. is. Yeah. We need to talk okay. Consider this. This is either the fourth or the fifth Scalfari interview. I was keeping track by hand. It's Someone amount, in the comments said six, but I think I think it's fourth or fifth. Yeah, I think so. It's weird. When I'm doing my rosary and I, I do it without a rosary if I'm on a run, I always I always forget whether I'm on the the fourth the uh, the fourth uh Hail Mary of the decade <laughs> yeah. of the fifth. I always get mixed up at four, four or five. And the same thing has something something about that number. But so I think it's the fifth. Imagine that, okay? People out there, you have to use your common sense. I, I'm, as I scanned to get at least one of these news articles on this travesty from yesterday mm -hmm. up, I came across a number of the Pope's planning articles. And oh what you have to do when you go through this, you have to use your common sense. We're going through the last instance of this. If a, if a journalist, not just an, a normal person, if he scandalized the Pope by saying, hey, this guy told me heresy, you think he would grant another interview? You think he would grant five of these things, four of these things? No way. Okay. Oh, yeah. No way. No you way. That doesn't I mean, let's happen. just use a, a practical example. Let's say, you know, we go on, uh, I don't know whose show, uh, Michael Matt or Patrick Coffin or Matt Fratt or something. And, and we do an interview with him. And then he goes on YouTube and says, yo, Marshall denies transubstantiation. I was hanging out with him the other day, and he said, sure. yeah, it's just bread and wine. People got this wrong. It's bread and wine. And, and he says, you know, now I didn't write it down and record it, but that's what he said. Quote, the Eucharist is just bread and wine, end quote. Right. If he said that, you can bet your bottom dollar I'm never talking to that guy ever again. And I'm doing three or four hours of commentary on YouTube saying, this is the Council of Trent. This is what happened at Fourth Lateran Council. Here's what Thomas Aquinas says, substance accidents. I'm going all day saying, I am not a heretic. I I'm a faithful son of the church. This is what Mother Church teaches. <coughs> and whoever interviewed me is bogus. Shame on them. Never talking to that guy again. He needs to repent. Right, right. Because you yeah, know what, you I been... take I take being a Catholic seriously, man. This is for me. I don't believe that I'm going to get what is he called disappeared, right? In Vanished. the afterlife, yeah. I believe I if I get this wrong, and I and I persevere in heresy, I'm going to burn for a thousand years, and then a million years, and then a billion years, and then twenty years, and then thousand years, and then a hundred thousand years, and nonstop. This right. is serious, not as a heart attack, serious as hell. Right, and yet the Pope and the Vatican, they, he just keeps going and talking to the guy, and they never but, outright deny it. So, but I, but the way these places, like, um, oh, I, I'm not going to start naming places. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying not to frag here, but all the Pope explaining articles, what they will say is that they'll admit this much about Francis, which they'll never do the rest of the time, and it's it's a false admission because this is not mm -hmm. the. It, it, you know, his folly is not ascribable to naivete. No, no, no. They're just like, look, he's being naive. He's being like over charitable, maybe to the point of foolishness. What are you talking about? This is literally 
uh, the equivalent of if it was a court case, a rape case, and a woman was cra- claiming she was raped, but she kept going and hanging out with a guy afterwards. You know, that that counts. You right. know, that's evidentiary. That's strongly evidentiary. He keeps going to offer this bad second rate hack journalist, Scafari, more interviews. And what does he keep? So that's that's really evidentiary. Right. I mean, strong. Yes. That's a punch. Yes. That's a punch if a jury's hearing that. But even more than that, even more strongly evidentiary, in my mind, it's nearly dispositive, you know, the strongest kind of evidentiary, is he never denies the stuff. He doesn't deny, he didn't, this was not a denial we got yesterday, I'm sure we're about to get to that. He said, he, you, he never, he skips a step where you say, no, this is wrong, I never said that, I say the opposite of that. I say the, uh, that's what you really want to say if you're defending right. yourself. We went on one of those shows, and they're saying we don't believe in hell. It'd be like the opposite. I believe in hell 100. percent Yes. Never would I say that. I never said anything, uh, anything like that, resembling that. So there's no real honest way this could be a, a an unhappy mistake. It's just they're lying. It has to be lying because yeah. I didn't say any. I, I could see if I were tripping around it, stumbling in in that uh, linguistic arena, but I wasn't. Right. They said yesterday, the essentially, it's coming in a second, I'd like to characterize it first. They essentially said, well, that's Scalfari paraphrasing, that's not a direct quote. Which is true, because that's how he takes notes. That's denial. essentially what I heard. It's not a denial. It's a non-denial, and it's essentially saying, he's paraphrasing the interview, so he didn't, so Pope Francis didn't say that exact block quote. But he's paraphrasing. That was the statement by a mouthpiece now i'm speaking these mornings i get up in in you know at 5 30 here in california you get up we talk these mornings for an hour an hour and a half then i go and i'm talking in front of class for for four and a half hours of lecture that day three hour and a half lectures and then you know maybe i'll write something whatever writing is a little different but we're you get you and i are using our voice to you know make a living and guess what? I don't have a press secretary. You don't have a press secretary. That is a luxury. Yes. So if you do have a press secretary that actually can say the next day or 12 hours later, no, this, is, this isn't this is what Gordon was saying. He doesn't want to, you know, close all Burger King restaurants. It just sounded like that or whatever. Um, people, people are trained with important figures, not you and I, but popes and presidents and heads of state to – Take the next day recharacterization at its word. It's a luxury they get. The rest of us don't yeah, get. These, if I these say press something secretaries stupid, make make six fig. Right, they make they these make are professionals. Six, six maybe it, you know if we're talking about presidential ones, maybe seven. Well, yeah, it's six six figures to do precisely have twenty four hours to spin it or twelve hours to spin it half the time. If someone like me or you goes in front of a classroom, and I might have already been talking for six hours that day of mm-hmm. lecture. This is a kind of lecture, dialogue. Then monologue, you know, one and a half hours times three each day. After yeah. I finish this, I drive to work. If I make one little mistake, something sounds a little bit racist, a little bit sexist, a little bit – Heretical. You know, some some flavor of the day. Yeah, but <laughs> heretical, honestly, you know, this is the <laughs> easiest <laughs> thing in this day to get away with. Yeah. But yeah, anything, and they want your head. And then, and, but but you know these these Pope splaining news services come out, and I'm I'm just laughing my way through them. They're saying, oh well, you know this isn't his fault. Uh, I mean, Raymond Royal was getting called. He was getting called a, a gossip monger yesterday. Yes, I want to defend Raymond Arroyo. We can't take the news that the journalist of choice that the Pope picks. At his word, we can't take the new. This right. is gossip now to do journalism. Yeah, let me let me uh, let me put Raymond Arroyo's uh, tweet that he's getting all this heat on. God bless you, Raymond. Good work. You're just a simple man from Louisiana. Nola, Nola. Here it is, right here, guys. Uh, Raymond says, "I find this hard to believe, but why does po- why does the Pope continue to grant interviews to an atheist?" who does not take notes and relies on his aged memory to reconstruct conversations. The Vatican must correct this. <laughs> and then people throw tomatoes at Raymond. 
How? how? That's like <laughs> just, <laughs> the world is upside down right now. Clown world. I mean, it's clown world. Let's go back. Let's go back to like, uh, you know, I, I'm on someone's show or I talk to someone and they get on YouTube and they Marshall denies transubstantiation. I heard he says after the consecration, it's just bread and wine, man. End quote. <laughs> Would my response be to come on here a week later and be like, well, that was his interpretation of what we talked about. Right, right. Like, what? Be like, what were you talking about, bro? I, I mean, so you like, were well, do you about... do you deny it? That's do you deny interpret- and like, well, that was his pre and that was his free and personal interpretation of it. Francis never denies. Francis, I mean, you got to respect that. You got to respect that. He does not back off one inch. Someone asks him, "Hey, did you know about McCarrick? Did you elevate McCarrick with with she and Sarah? Did you do this?" Pope Francis, and he says, I'm not going to say one word about that. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe I will later, maybe I won't. But for now, I'm not going to say one word, and you're going to sit there, and you're going to take it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> bravo, you know? I mean, because I'm You sick. think he's just I'm trolling sick. us? You think someone in the in, in the Vatican press office is like, hey, things are getting kind of crazy right now with this whole Amazon sending? And he's like, what if we just, like, bring in Scalfari this week? And let him publish something. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. Troll him. Well, I, no, I, you're, you're saying it as a joke. I wanted to make this point And you're reminding me. No, I, 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 I mean, I'm to me, it's trying so to ruin absurd, a but, but it might be real. No, I think, no, I no. So this is a signal. Uh, this is the, my strong conjecture. I have a really strong hunch. Look, this is a signal. You have all the Soros operatives gathered there for the Amazon Synod, Right. The, the, their main goal is their, their hatred of Christianity. They have, yes, one world government. That's their main efficient material goal. But their main final formal goal is anti-Christianity, right. uh, it, anti-Christian utopianism, which is hell on earth. Yes. And he's got all these guys there. He's got the world's ear for these three weeks. And... My guess is that he said, look, I'm going to give you some signals during this synod that'll let you know we're taking this thing to 11. We're taking it to the next lot notch. When you see and the Scalfari article, <laughs> you know. If you didn't already know, you're going to know. When you see the Pope saying to the entire free world and the unfree world, Jesus was not God. I This is surprised even me and i've been of everyone i know all my personal friends all my family all the other personalities talking heads writing hands you know bleeding pens everyone i know i've I've been the hardest to surprise on the francis pontificate from the outset people just said you're you have no faith you need to pray for blah, blah blah i'm like not no i have faith in jesus and his church that doesn't mean church men this surprised me this was a couple notches up. I, I just think this is I think this is the biggest deal yet. Yeah. Think about, you know, we always bring this back to because we're both fathers. Think if my kids heard something. Someone said, hey, you know what? Your dad said that promiscuous sex is A-OK. I was watching his YouTube. He said promiscuous sex is OK and told my four teenagers that. And they're like, hey, dad. All these people at school are saying that you said on a YouTube video that promiscuous sex is okay. And I just said to my kids, as a dad, as the guardian of their souls and their morality, well, that's just some people's interpretation of what I teach. Right. What right. the hell kind of dad would I be? What the hell kind of teachings are you making? Yeah, because that's, yeah. that's not that easy a mistake to make. Yeah. Yeah. I would want to sit them on the couch and be like, no, no, what, what was going on? Who said this? Okay, no, no, this is what this is what I say. This is what I teach. Let's make sure we all understand. Let's go through it, right? Because we as Catholics don't want to believe that the Pope would say such a thing. So we want him as our dad. We're like, Dad, this doesn't make sense. Can you clarify this for us? And then here we are, years later, no dubia answer. Here we are, days later, lame Holy See press office response. Let me put this on. I'm going to read it. It's so lame. It's so pathetic. 
Here it is. The Holy See's press office director, Matteo Bruni. You know who this guy is, Tim? I, I don't know much about the new no. guy, Bruni. I didn't Issued even the, recognize his name. The following official response to Scalfari's report. Quote, <clears throat> as already stated on other occasions, the words that Dr. Eugenio Scalfari attributes in quotation marks to the Holy Father during conversations with him cannot be considered as a faith considered as a faithful account of what has actually been said, but rather represent a personal and free interpretation of what he has heard, as is quite evident from what has been written today about the divinity of Jesus Christ, end quote. It acknowledges it's about the divinity of Jesus Christ. It doesn't affirm the divinity of Jesus Christ. It it's makes it personal worse. personal and free interpretation. It doesn't say it is incorrect. It is a lie. Right. It is right. heresy. Right. No, I mean... That part, that last line, I was focusing on my firepower yesterday when I was thinking about this. I was focusing it all on the second to last line. The last line really does uh, stoke the fire, the flames. Yeah. Because it acknowledges, yeah, we, we know Scalfari. Scalfari is just a journalist. He's not a theologian. So maybe they could have said, look, he doesn't even know that this divinity of Christ question is like a big deal. Um Right. And has been since before the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century, early fourth century. How far he, he knows. He's an Italian. Well, he, atheist. He, he does, but they don't even bother to he, – he does know, of course. But they don't even bother to say, well, maybe it's just – in America, we buy that journalists might not know about you know, on ABC, NBC, CBS. They might not know what the Council of Nicaea is. But that's not what they're even saying. That's not the defense. So like, this is about the divinity of Christ, and yeah, we're we're that's he's he's paraphrasing Francis on the divinity of Christ, and Francis denies it. I mean, that's what I hear in that in that non-denial. Yeah, it makes it and, ten times worse. And like you said, he keeps going back to Scalfari. You know, it's almost like you know at the Vatican at the Vatican press office, it's kind of like. Here comes Scofari again. Wink, wink. We're sure going to troll those fundamentalists. Like, right. What's it going to be this time? Right. Already, I mean, as if denying hell was one. Now we've got this. This is the heart of Christianity. You deny this, there is no point. There is no... If Jesus is just a good teacher like the Buddha, Siddhartha, or if he's just a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King Jr., if that's what he is... Even if he's the best one of that set, so what? Right. Why you get up on Sunday and go to mass with your eight kids? Right. Right. What's the point, people? There is no point. And guess what? That's why no one goes to mass anymore. Right. You, know, you walk around Rome on a Sunday, the churches are empty. People don't know. go to church. In fact, I was went into this church... Uh, it was the Redemptorist Church near Santa Maria Maggiore, where the icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help is. There was a mass going on there. I just wanted to go visit the icon. There was a mass. I thought of you, Tim, because I sat in the back and just prayed and prayed for for everybody watching, prayed for you, Tim, prayed for priests I know, just kind of went through my nice. intercessions. And and uh, it was a Novus Ordo mass in Italian. Uh, there was probably 25 people there. Half of them were American tourists. I could just tell. Yeah. Yeah. And in the back, about, I was in the back, back, <clears throat> but there was a lady about six rows in front of me who was in the back of that congregation. And it came time for communion, Tim. I kid you not. Hmm. She rummages through her sack, pulls <laughs> out the Purell, pump, pump, oh, yeah. pump, 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 and goes yeah. forward to get communion in the hand. And I'm like, man, we the Americans even bring their Purell with them to mass. That's just so in ridiculous. case the Italians don't bring it out at the beginning. Oh my <laughs> goodness. I was like, can we please have communion on the tongue? Get rid of all of this. Please. Germophobic who Purell. Yeah, who started the Purell? Huh? Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're who started the Purell? If you're germophobic, take it on the mouth. I don't get why they try to say. I told you about my misadventures where they tried to say, well, if you're germophobic, take it on the hand. It's like, 
Dude, I'm like George Costanza. I work at a high school. I don't even touch my Snickers bar. I eat it with a fork, like yeah. George Costanza, right? Don't touch it with your hands if you're a like, I'm the guy when, the I go, when I go in and out of the bathroom, especially when I leave the bathroom, I I'm, use my foot to open the door. I don't even I use, or this. I do this with my shirt and I yeah. yeah. So but so so guys like if you're a germaphobe, which I am, take it on the mouth. Yeah. I mean, take it on the mouth anyway. But it's the it, most it, sanitary it's way to receive reason. on the tongue. Yeah. People say, well, doesn't the priest touch your tongue? The priest hasn't touched. I receive only on the tongue. The priest is, I haven't had a priest touch my tongue. It's happened in 10 years, two or three times. Yeah. It's very rare. He's very bad if he does that. Yeah. He, I and mean, it's, yeah, it's usually people not who don't evil. know what's up. Yeah. But, a, a Latin mass priest, he doesn't want to touch your tongue. He knows how to do it. Right. To him, it's and an it's, art. It's not that hard anyway. He Look, practices like, so as not to touch your tongue. You know what it is? It's holding a quarter. I can touch my iPad right now without touching my fingers to it. With a quarter? It's yes. like that much. That's it's a bigger lot. Bigger than of, a quarter sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So could you touch your keyboard with a quarter without touching your finger to the keyboard? Obviously. It's like, yeah, unless you're having a stroke. Like, <laughs> it's not hard. Or not you have to like do. Parkinson's. You can't, you know, can't hold steady. Right. People yeah. are gonna say we're this making fun of the and everybody now. watching. If you've been you've been watching us long enough, you know, don't receive communion on the hand. Come on, right. be a Catholic, right? Show some and respect. I, I, and by the way, while we're on church in Rome, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm gonna say this. People need to be mad about the the paganism. This is off subject for a second, but it's back on the synod. I was just getting mad. I mean, we were getting really mad around dinner last night talking about this. Me, my wife, my brother, his wife. People need to be tearing down anything that is idol, idolatrous in churches around Rome. You need you, we need a, a what was his name? Jakob, the the kid, yeah, the Polish, Polish kid. kid. We need some acts of civil disobedience. Don't don't hurt anyone, don't harm anyone, but we need we cannot. You cannot stand by, and and allow idols to be put up in a church. So you got you got to you got to pull those down. You got to take down. one for the team. You're not allowed to not. I mean, this is Old Testament type stuff. We have to. It's be New Testament. Like, Boniface it's New Testament too. chops the tree down. Right. Uh, Saint Benedict uh, destroyed a, an old Roman uh, shrine. The founder of the Benedictines. I mean, this is just what we Catholic people do. Right. You remove the pagan, you remove the sacrilegious, especially if you're a priest. We need some priests right. to stand up right now. I've got to say it. If you're out there wearing yeah. the Roman collar, yeah. don't 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 take a picture of yourself with a Saturno and say I'm part of the resistance. No, I like that's it. Aesthetics. It's yeah. good, but that's not enough. You need to preach. You need to preach against this nonsense. You need to get a hefty sack and gather up the element OP and the pagan and all that stuff, put it in the hefty sack, take it out to the curb. Right. And you know what guy, priests, fathers, reverend fathers, if you do that, yes, you're going to get in big trouble with the chancery. Yes. With your Bishop. So what? It's called white martyrdom. It's yeah. called white martyrdom. And that's what it's you called are being called a man. Be. It's called being a man, but a be it's called being an ordained man. Now one yeah. level up here. I'm calling on the bishops. Cause I, I know, I know some prelates watch this show. Yes. The bishops who are good and silent need to stop. Okay. This is th that yesterday has to be it. That mm -hmm. it just, you have to start speaking out because when you say, what can I do? What can I do? It's a monarchy. This is, this is the problem, right? When a monarchy turns into a, a tyranny. Yeah. I'm not saying you can single handedly or even in, uh, in plural, you can, Depo. That's not what we're talking about. But when there's no resistance, when there's no bishop speaking out saying, what was this? Wait, wait, wait. We're all calling not one of these filial appeals, but just literally make, releasing statements to your own press office, wherever you are, wherever your C is in the world. Mm -hmm. Just say, look, this is no, I don't know what's going on here. I, I, I call this out. Yes, there might be some white martyrdom involved, but there are good. There are more good bishops in the world than three or four yeah. bishops and they need to say something and many of them many of them i'm hearing more and more uh watch or, or somewhat pay attention so if they're out there you have to say something yeah. right you don't have to Time say to it martyr. As, white martyr. yes this is it the you, arianism Tim, in the vatican 
imagine if Nancy Pelosi one day was on the mic and she's like, and I just want to say we need to make abortion illegal and shut down Planned Parenthood. Good night, everyone. And got off the mic. What would the Democrat leaders across the country do? Right. Right. They would crucify her. They'd destroy her. Every single one of them would destroy her within 48 hours. They would speak up. They would scream. They would go hysterical. They would call for a resignation. They would go insane. Yes. And yet here we have the Pope of the Catholic Church, Vicar of Christ, who has been alleged to have said something. No clarification. People need to say, even if it was said, hey, I was hanging out. You're on, we're watching CNN. Hey, the CNN reporter just said they were hanging out with Nancy Pelosi. She said, let's make abortion illegal and shut down Planned Parenthood. People would be knocking on the right. doors of Nancy right. Pelosi. Did you actually say this? About well, this right. free interpretation. No, we want to know. Did you say it? We need our bishops and our cardinals and our lay people and our religious. Everybody needs to say, do, do you believe Jesus is son of God? It's a binary right. question, yes or no. And we want to know a little bit more about this. Do you believe he right. does miracles? Do you believe that the womb, I mean, sorry, that the body that was born of the Virgin Mary is the same body who stood up and rose again? Yes or no? Right. We need binary, clear answers on this. Because if you don't give clear answers, you're condemned. I want to read this quote. I put it out here before I forget. This is the condemnation of a pope named Pope Honorius. Pope Honorius from the 600s. Yeah. Pope Leo II, who was a pope after Honorius, wrote this. Make sure I got... Yep, yeah, this is Leo II. This is from around 682, the year of our Lord. Pope Leo writes this, And we in like manner anathematize the inventors of the new era, namely Theodore, Bishop of Farnon, Cyrus of Alexandria, Sergius, Pyrrhus, and also Honorius, who did not purify this apostolic church by the doctrine of the apostolic tradition, rather Amen. attempted to subvert the immaculate faith by profane treason. Wow. So Amen. he anathematizes another pope, a previous pope, and, he, and why he did not purify the apostolic church by the doctrine of the apostolic tradition, but rather attempted to subvert the immaculate faith by profane treason. What did Honorius do? He wrote one, maybe two letters to Patriarch Sergius saying, Christ can have either one or two wills. In Catholicism, we believe two wills, the divine will and the human will, one for each nature. And he calls it treason. It is treason. That's why. The Pope Honorius, anathema sit, committed treason against the Catholic Church. It's happened once, folks. It can happen again. Yeah. Everybody go read about it is Pope Honorius. H-O, that's how you say it, Honorius. Pope Honorius. It's like honor with eus on the end. A dishonorable man, anathema sit. Puh. It's it's hard to express how how upset and weirded out and angry I was all day yesterday. I still feel now. I woke up feeling it, but it's it's it gets to be one of those things like it it I mean, in front of a screen it might blend in, but yesterday was a new moment. Like people need to people need to work out their kinks. For one thing, you need to go to confession, live close to the sacraments because this means something something serious. And and yet, in you know, your anger is good. We were talking about Hope's two beautiful daughters, anger and courage, mm -hmm. St. Augustine's quote. And you need to keep that. It needs to be uh, – we don't want to lose the war of attrition. We want to keep that anger going. And, uh, you know, two days ago when we did the show on the Synod, plenty to be angry about there. But now there's this signpost that he's dropping to Scalfari. He did this. He does this when um, he knows how to use the media well. Yeah, and he he did uh, one Scalfari interview during one of the synods. I forget whether it's fourteen or fifteen. That was like the second or third one that he did with Scalfari. There, there's you know, it's a it's diversionary. We don't know exactly what's going on behind the scenes, but we want to maintain our <clears throat> righteous anger and our righteous indignation and in saying, like you at, like you post the question, binary, answer yes or no. Yeah. I mean. At a, at a pontifical um, audience, you know, mass, Wednesdays, someone needs to go and just say, you know, Holy Father, you, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? You, you, you don't equivocate. 
don't obfuscate here. Would do yes or no? I mean, you're probably not going to answer you, but people need to do this every Wednesday from here on out. You're, yeah, we have the right to know. Yes. Hmm. All right, let's close. I, I like how you're getting a little personal there. For me, the breaking point was being in Rome. That was hard, especially the first day. I went there and, you know, I have such fond memories of being in Rome, especially under Benedict XVI and just the majesty of it and the churches and visiting the relics and just this sense that I'm surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses. Yeah. Now, it doesn't feel that way. Really? It feels like a not a cloud of great witnesses. It feels like a cloud, just a clouds over the city. By the time I left and it was with good people and, and, you know, conversations and going to masses and all that, you know, it was better. But when I first got there, I, there, I definitely, personally, I was having a hard time being in Rome. It was like, because, you know, here, you know, you, you talk to your kids and you have things going on in school and, you know, this meeting with your, you know, with the teacher and then a date with your wife. You know, like, there's all this stuff, but just being in Rome alone. And just looking at it and thinking about it and the pain, like everything was just intense, intense, intense. And then you're getting on your phone pictures of things already going on in the pre-ceremonies of the Amazonian Synod. Constantly yeah. pictures. A woman nursing a dog, idols, planting of the tree, the Pope getting a black ring. I mean, it's just constantly hitting you. It was, it's hard, yeah. man. It had to be. I was thinking about it when you're out there like, I haven't been out there since 2008, and it was, it felt like home. We were there long enough yeah. to, to, for it to feel like home. And I, I was thinking of that one scene in Ghostbusters where you know they they open up the thing. The yeah, EPA yeah. villain villain of Ghostbusters one is the EPA. It's a it's a right wing movie. They make them open the the uh, the machine that that holds all the ghosts, and then they're released over New York City. And I I just think that's that's how you had to feel yeah. in Rome. And I wonder, I, I'm sure I would feel similarly yeah. being back there because I just was so, such a beautiful city. Mm. But it's like a, it's like a, a ghost town. The, the ghosts of, you know, the saints. The ghosts of pagan the halls. Right, right. Well, he's I mean, got the, it, this, it's complicated anyway. This is a pagan city. I wrote a whole book on it called The Eternal City. Why, do, why is Rome the capital of Catholicism? I wrote this book to explain why Rome is so important. And the thesis of this book is, Rome was a pagan, idolatrous, sexually immoral capital. It was so evil. And yeah. yet, because of the prophecies of Daniel and Old Testament prophecies, the New Covenant inherited it as its new capital away from Jerusalem. There's a lot of theological reasons for that. Read the book. But this city, which was so sexually immoral and pagan and idolatrous and evil and killed the martyrs, that city was scrubbed clean by the blood of Peter, Paul, and then all the martyrs right on up to Constantine. Their blood purchased the Roman church. I mean, Christ our Lord died on a Roman cross. Roman cross. Not a Jewish cross, not a Syrian cross. A Roman cross. His blood sanctified what it means to be Roman. And then his vicar, Peter, went to Rome and with his blood purchased the city of Rome. That's amazing. Yeah. So to go back in 2019 and see paganism not only returning amongst the people, but the very vicar of Christ in the Vatican Gardens where where his where Peter died a martyr's death, just a stone throws away, engaging in pagan rites. Yeah. Is this the end? Could could be. Could be the beginning of the end. I like that though. I like what you're saying about Rome. That's a good. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. You wrote a book on it, so I guess. All right, makes sense. What do we got to do? Pray the rosary every day. I'm trying to get. I, I have. I'm, I'm. I'm busy with family. I need to get to 15 decades because it's so bad right now. Uh, my plan has always been to do five decades a day, and then on Sundays, I go for 15. Uh, but I really kind of feel like seven days a week, I need to somehow get through the whole rosary. I haven't figured that out yet. But yeah. definitely, people, we have to live the message of Fatima, and we need to meditate every day. I mean, you need to read scripture every day, but if you don't, praying the rosary 
helps you meditate on scripture. Right. And just to be close to Our Lady. She's the mom. Right. You know, things yeah. might be bad in the family, but you can cuddle up to mom. Yeah. And, and she'll pat you on the head and say, I got a plan for this. So in order to feel that, you got to pray the rosary every day. If you don't pray the rosary, you're not on the team. I don't care how many Saturnos you wear on your head, you know, how many uh, books you have about the Latin mass or whatever. If you're not praying the rosary, you're just not on the team. Now, you know, right. when I travel around, even in Rome, one of the, the greatest rewards I receive is people say, hey, I wasn't praying the rosary and now I pray the rosary every day. Thank you. To I me, see that on Twitter. Yeah, that's great. You know, to me, that's great. It's great. So, all right, we'll pray the rosary. And speaking of praying, we'll pray our prayer, pray the Hail Mary, ask Our Lady to help us. And uh, let's do that now. Here we go. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Sancta Maria Mater Dei, Mater Dei. or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et et mortis nostre. Amen. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. St. Peter, Amen. pray for us. St. Paul, pray for us. Pray for us. Tom, the Baptist, pray for us. Pray for us. Our Lady Exterminatrix of all heresies, pray for us. Pray for us. In the name us. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Please support on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Dr. Taylor Marshall. Subscribe, hit the bell, and please share this on Facebook and Twitter. That's been working really well. Y'all been doing that. That's awesome. So hit the little share button on the bottom right below this video and share it on Facebook, Twitter, uh, message it to your friends, whatever you guys are doing. It's doing, doing really good. So Thanks, everybody. God bless, and we'll see you in videos to come. Signing off.